Chapter 2. Try your luck with Professor Challenger. I always liked McArdle, the crabbed, old, roundback, red-headed news editor, and I rather hoped that he liked me. Of course, Beaumont was the real boss, but he lived in the rarefied atmosphere of some Olympian height from which he could distinguish nothing smaller than an international crisis or a split in the cabinet. Sometimes we saw him passing in lonely majesty to his inner sanctum, with his eyes staring vaguely and his mind hovering over the Balkans or the Persian Gulf. He was above and beyond us, but McArdle was his first lieutenant, and it was he that we knew. The old man nodded as I entered the room, and he pushed his spectacles far up onto his bald forehead. Well, Mr. Malone, from all I hear, you seem to be doing quite well. He said this in a Scottish accent. I thanked him. The coronary explosion was excellent. So was the Southwark fire. You have the true descriptive touch. What did you want to see me about, Ned? To ask a favor, sir. He looked alarmed, and his eyes shunned mind. Well, tut tut, what is it then? Do you think, sir, that you could possibly send me on some mission for the paper? I would do my best to put it through and get you some good copy. What sort of mission had you in mind, Mr. Malone? Well, sir, anything that had adventure and danger in it. I really would do my very best. The more difficult it was, the better it would suit me. You seem very anxious to lose your life. No, to justify my life, sir. Dear me, Mr. Malone, this is very exalted. I'm afraid the day for this sort of thing is rather past. The expense of a special mission business hardly justifies the result. And of course, in any case, it would only be an experienced man with a name that would command public confidence who would ever get such an order. The big blank spaces in the map are being filled in, and there's no room for romance anywhere. No money in the budget, either. Wait a bit, though, he added, with a sudden smile upon his face. Talking of the blank spaces of the map gives me an idea. What about exposing a fraud? A modern Munchausen, and making him ridiculous? You could show him up as the liar that he is. Hey, man, it would be fine. Does this appeal to you? I thought about it for a moment. Anything really, sir. I care nothing about the actual story. McArdle was plunged into thought of his own for some moments. I wonder whether you could get on friendly, or at least on talking terms with the fellow, he said at last. You seem to have a sort of genius for establishing relations with people. Sympathy, I suppose, or animal magnetism or youthful vitality, or something. I'm conscious of it myself. I was a little embarrassed by this. You are very good, sir. So then, why should you not try your luck with Professor Challenger of Enmore Park? I dare say I looked a little startled at this. Challenger, I cried. Professor Challenger, the famous zoologist? Wasn't he the man who broke the skull, Blundell, of the telegraph? My news editor smiled grimly. Well, do you mind? Didn't you say it was adventure you were after? It is all in the way of business, sir, I stammered. Exactly. I don't suppose he can always be so violent as that. I'm thinking that Blundell got him at the wrong moment, maybe or in the wrong fashion. You may have better luck, or more tact, in handling him. There's something in your line there, I am sure, and the Gazette should work it. I 
sometimes a bit nervous at this. I really know nothing about him, I said. I only remember his name in connection with the police court proceedings for striking Blundell. Well, I have a few notes for your guidance, Mr. Malone. I've had my eye on the professor for some time. He took a paper from his drawer. Here is a summary of his records. I'll give it to you briefly. Challenger, George Edward, born Largs, N.B., 1863. Education, Largs Academy, Edinburgh University. British Museum Assistant, 1892. Assistant Keeper of Comparative Anthropology Department, 1893. He resigned after acrimonious correspondence that same year. Winner of Crayston Medal for Zoological Research. Foreign member of, well, quite a lot of things. It's about two inches of small type. Society Belge, American Academy of Sciences, La Plata. It says here he's even ex-president of the Paleontological Society, Section H, British Association, and so on, so on course publications too. Some observations upon a series of Kalmuk skulls, outlines of vertebrae evolution, numerous papers I see, including the underlying fallacy of Wisemanism. This, you know, caused heated discussions at the Zoological Congress at Vienna. Recreations, walking, alpine climbing. His address is in Kensington. Here, take this with you. I have nothing more for you tonight, though. I pocketed the slip of paper. One moment, sir, I said. I realized that it was a pink bald head and not a red face which was fronting me. I am not very clear yet why I am to interview this gentleman. What has he done? His face flashed a smile. The man went to South America on a solitary expedition two years ago. He came back last year, had undoubtedly been to South America, but refused to say where, began to tell his adventures in a vague way. But somebody started to pick holes, and he just shut up like an oyster. And then something wonderful happened, or the man's a champion liar, I'm not sure, although that is the more probable suspicion. He had these damaged photographs, said to be fakes, got so touchy that he assaults anyone who asks questions. He even heaves reporters down the stairs. In my opinion, he's just a homicidal megalomaniac with a turn for science. That's your man, Mr. Malone. Now off you run and see what you can make of him. You're big enough to look after yourself, I think. Anyway. You have his information, and you should be safe. The Employer's Liability Act might protect you. A grinning red face turned once more into a pink oval, fringed with a gingery fluff. The interview was at an end. I walked across to the Savage Club, but instead of turning into it, I leaned upon the railings of Adelphi Terrace and gazed thoughtfully for a long time at the brown oily river. I can always think most sanely and clearly in the open air. I took out my list of Professor Challenger's exploits, and I read it under an electric lamp. Then I had what I can only regard as inspiration. As a journalist, I feel sure, from what I had been told, that I could never hope to get in touch with this cantankerous professor. But these recriminations, twice mentioned in his skeleton biography, could only mean that he was a fanatic in science. Was there not an exposed margin thereupon he might be accessible? I could try. I entered the club. It was just after eleven, and the big room was fairly full, though the rush had not set in yet. I noticed a tall, thin, angular man 
was seated in an armchair by the fire. He turned as I drew my chair up to his. It was the man of all others whom I could have chosen. Tarp Henry, of the staff of nature, a thin, dry, leathery creature, who was full, to those who knew him, of kindly humanity. I plunged instantly into my subject. What do you know about Professor Challenger? Challenger? He gathered his brows in scientific disapproval. Challenger was the man who came with some cock and bull story from South America. What story? Oh, it was rank nonsense about some strange animals he had discovered. I believe he has retracted it since. Anyhow, he has suppressed it all. He gave an interview to Reuters, and there was such a howl that he saw it wouldn't do. It was a discreditable business. There were one or two folk who were inclined to take him seriously, but he soon choked them off. How so? Well, by his insufferable rudeness and impossible behavior. There was poor old Wadley of the Zoological Institute. Wadley sent a message. The professor of the Zoological Institute presents his compliments to Professor Challenger and would take it as a personal favor if he would do them the honor and come to their next meeting. The answer was unprintable. I laughed a little at this. You don't say. Well, a bolderized version of it would run. Professor Challenger presents his compliments to the president of the Zoological Institute and would take it as a personal favor if he would send himself to the devil. Good lord, I said. Yes, I expect that's what old Wadley said as well. I remember his wail at the meeting, which began, In my fifty years' experience of scientific intercourse, it quite broke the old man up. Anything more about Challenger? Well, I'm a bacteriologist, you know. I live in a 900 diameter microscope. I can hardly claim to take serious notice of anything that I can see with my naked eye. I'm a frontiersman from the extreme edge of the knowable, and I feel quite out of place when I leave my study and come into touch with all of you great, rough, hulking creatures. I'm too detached to talk scandal, and yet, at scientific conversations, I have heard something of Challenger, for he is one of those men whom nobody can ignore. He's as clever as they make him, a full-charged battery of force and vitality, but he's quarrelsome, an ill-conditioned faddist, and unscrupulous at that. He had gone the length of faking some photographs over this South American business. Wait a second, you say he's a faddist? What's his particular fad? Well, he has a thousand. But the latest is something about wise men and evolution. He had a fearful row about it in Vienna, I believe. Can you tell me the point? Uh, not at the moment, but a translation of the proceedings exists. We have it filed in the office. Would you care to come? I guess it's just what I want. I have to interview this fellow, and I need something to lead up to him. It's really awfully good of you to give me a lift. I can go now if you're ready. One half hour later, I was seated in the newspaper office with a huge book in front of me. It had been opened at the article, Wiseman vs. Darwin with a subheading, Spirited Protest at Vienna, Lively Proceedings. My scientific education having been somewhat neglected, I was unable to follow the whole argument, but it was evident that the English professor had handled his subject in a very aggressive fashion, and it had thoroughly annoyed his continental colleagues. Protests, uproar general appeal to the chairman were three of the first brackets which caught my eye. Most of the matter might have been written in Chinese, for any definite meaning 
that it conveyed to my brain. I wish you could translate this into English for me, I said pathetically to my helper. Well, uh, it is a translation. I guess I'd better try my luck with the original then. No, it's certainly rather deep for a layman. If only I could get a single good, meaty sentence which seemed to convey some sort of definite human idea, it would serve me well. Hey, wait a minute. This one might do. I seem in a vague way almost to understand it. I'll copy it out. This shall be my link with the terrible professor. Nothing else I can do, sir? Well, yes. I propose to write to him. If I could frame the letter here and use your address, it would give atmosphere. We'll have the fellow round here making a row and breaking the furniture, though. No, no, no. You'll see the letter. Nothing contentious, I assure you. Okay, well, that's my chair and desk over there. You'll find paper there, too. I do want to censor it before it goes. It took me some time, but I flatter myself that it wasn't such a bad job. It was finished at last. I read it aloud to the critical bacteriologist with some pride in my handiwork. Dear Professor Challenger, it said, as a humble student of nature, I have always taken the most profound interest in your speculations as to the differences between Darwin and Wiseman. I have recently had occasion to refresh my memory by rereading. Hey, wait a minute, you infernal liar, murmured Tarp Henry. Uh, let me finish. By rereading your masterly address at Vienna, that lucid and admirable statement seems to be the last word on the matter. There is one sentence in it, however, namely, I protest strongly against the insufferable and entirely dogmatic assertion that each separate id is a microcosm possessed of a historic architecture elaborated slowly through the series of generations. Have you no desire, in your view of later research, to modify this statement, sir? Do you not think it is over-accentuated? With your permission, I would ask the favor of an interview, as I feel strongly upon the subject and have certain suggestions which I could only elaborate in a personal conversation. With your consent, I trust to have the honor of calling at 11 o'clock the day after tomorrow. That's Wednesday morning. I remain, sir, with assurances of profound respect, yours very truly, Edward D. Malone. Well, what do you think? I asked triumphantly. Well, if your conscience can stand it. Hey, it hasn't failed me yet. What do you mean to do then? To get there. Once I am in his room, I may see an opening. I may even go the length of open confession. If he is a sportsman, he will be tickled. Ha, <sighs> tickled indeed. He's much more likely to do the tickling chain mail or an American football suit. That's what you'll want. Well, goodbye. I'll have the answer for you here on Wednesday morning, if he even deigns to answer you. He is a violent, dangerous, cantankerous character, hated by everyone who comes across him, and the butt of the students, so far as they dare take a liberty with him. Perhaps it would be best for you if you never heard from this fellow at all.